I think that a lot of people on the internet, they fall into that trap that they get known for the one thing. And that's the one thing that they're always going to be known for on the internet. And that's not how people work. People change and evolve over time. People grow old. I, I get, uh, you know, I periodically get comments going, mm, you didn't age very well, did you? Mm, good. That was necessary. Hello, everyone. And welcome to One Story Building, where the storytellers come and tell the stories about the stories that happened in the world, whatever. Today's guest is movie critic, video producer, and sweater enthusiast, even though he's not wearing one now, so forget it, gone, never mind. It's Matthew Buck, or... Hey, hey. Hey, hey, indeed. Should I call you Film Brain? Is that still a thing that's your title? I mean, yeah, you can call me that if you, if you want. You can call me Matthew if you like. It's it's either or. I, I don't mind, honestly. I'm Mr. Flexible. Buck. Mr. <laughs> Buck. <laughs> that sounds a little bit full. That, that, <laughs> see, that used to be a gag I would do. I would just say say Mr. Something as like a joke, <laughs> like a recurring joke, because it always sounds really weird. <laughs> so like that would always be a thing I would do. It's like, hmm, that's, that's kind of a funny thing to do. <laughs> okay, well, fair enough. Matty. M, M, M dog, the M Meister. What I think, uh, well, what of course spearheaded your internet celebrity fame was your movie review show, Bad Movie Beatdown. Could you just tell us all about the, the genesis of Bad Movie Beatdown and why did you decide to make it? Ooh, uh, have, you got, have you got time? <laughs> hours, uh, so, hours. So, the way that Bad Movie Beatdown started is that, um, so I originally kind of came from the background of in my teens, I used to read the Agony Booth, which was a website that did these kind of very long, very in-depth written recaps of bad movies. And I wanted to be on that website for a while. And then I, I kind of got rejected by, by them in an application process. But that was also around the same time where the internet itself was transitioning away from sort of text-based things and more towards video. And that was the kind of pivot that was happening. I mean, obviously James Rolfe was around at that time and Doug Walker was also emerging around that time. And so me and my friends had kind of seen this, this sort of emerging and we kind of uh, thought of an idea of kind of doing a, a similar sort of bad movie review show. And the idea was to try and differentiate itself from, say, Doug Walker's Nostalgia Critic at the time, because he obviously was dealing in nostalgic prophecies. So the idea is, oh, we'll cover newer movies instead or things that wouldn't necessarily be covered by him because they might be a bit too obscure. So... We kind of came up with this this show together, uh, me, Chris, and Lewis, and it was originally meant to be sort of like this three man show, kind of almost like this roundtable kind of idea in retrospect that kind of would have been like an early podcast sort of thing. And that's that I think that's kind of interesting in hindsight that it could have gone in that direction. And then it kind of moved into kind of me being the on camera presence, and me and Chris wrote. I was sort of back and forth on a lot of the early scripts. Uh, he also edited some of the very earliest episodes, like uh, Equilibrium, Fast and Furious, uh, Aim vs. Press. So some of those were handled by Chris, and some of the editing was handled by me. And I was I I got picked up by uh, that guy with the glasses, as it was known at the time, aka Channel Awesome, for writing articles because I would go on what was their blog section and write these movie reviews every day. They're about a thousand words or so. And I got nervous and picked up there. So I wasn't picked up on Channel Awesome for doing videos. I was picked up for doing articles. But I soon realized there wasn't really much of a future in that. I didn't feel like people were reading that particular section. So I started to, tr to pivot into video. And obviously Doug Walker's five second movies at the time was a big thing. So the way that I started to transition was doing the sort of five mo second movie thing like Doug would do. So I would kind of do these sort of throwaway gag videos as a way of kind of practicing. And then I, w I transitioned into doing a, a review show. And so I was literally learning on the job, uh, which I, I guess is a little bit of a slightly privileged pr position in retrospect that I got, that I was featured on a website whilst doing something that I didn't have a whole bunch of experience in. 
because um, me and my friends, we used to go on Saturdays, this kind of, um, I, gu I guess this kind of, uh, I guess the sort of production, <laughs> so, like I'm trying to struggle to describe it. this sort of production kind of Saturday thing where you would film stuff and you would learn how to edit in Final Cut and things like that as, you know, like a kid's activity. So that that was how I kind of met them to start off with and kind of got an idea of how to edit but i i didn't know how to do that locally so i was kind of learning all those abilities on the job so that's how we kind of started out and yeah so it's kind of it's kind of come along from there slowly but surely <laughs> Yeah, because at, at the start of at least the Bad Movie Beatdown videos, it it says created by Matthew Buck, Christopher Bernard, and Lewis Rogers. But you you're the mm. you're the star, you're the main guy. So why why mm. why are you better than them? I don't know actually. I think it was just because I was probably the most enthusiastic <laughs> about being on camera. I could I, I, I do have a little bit of a performance streak in me, I guess. I mean, Chris does appear on camera. He was um, Professor Celluloid because comedy Germans. And um, yeah, so he, he he would appear on camera from time to time. Lewis, I think, popped up a couple of times in, in there as well. But I was largely the on-camera presence, I guess, because it was felt that I, I, I could carry the scripts the most. And yeah, I think that was kind of how that, that kind of came about. And it, but it was still a very collaborative process, at least early on. We were still kind of pitching ideas to each other. And if Chris was editing a video, he'd send it to me and I'd have a look through it and I'd send back notes like, OK, I'd change this stuff and change this stuff and so on and so forth. And he'd send me notes about my edits. So it was really kind of a collaborative process going on early. And so for the, that was about the first two years or so. Chris was probably the most actively involved uh, as a, as a co-collaborator, at least in the early years. You mentioned the blog on the Channel Awesome website, and from what mm. I remember, a lot of that was people trying to put out content to then get picked up by the Channel Awesome team. And one, probably one of the reasons mm. why I saw it as that is because that's what I used it for a decade ago when I used to make <laughs> make make my own videos. When you started. Before uh, you were picked up by Channel Awesome, was that that specifically, or something like that, a bit of a a bit of a goal of yours to be to be ele elevated to that position? Yeah, it was really. I I, I kind of wanted to be picked up I, because obviously, you know, it, at the time it was kind of this this big deal to be picked up because you know there was a lot of momentum behind the website at the time. And it, it, you know, it'd be nice to be on the same space as it were, kind of doing similar things. And I think the the management at the time had a very similar idea. And they wanted people that kind of came from that same environment. And I remember the blogs being a very competitive space. A lot of people mm -hmm. did come up from the blog section. Like I remember Mike Jevons, he got picked up onto the site because he was posting his shameful sequels videos. In, in the blog section, the blog section effectively became a de not less about writing articles and more like a like a de facto sort of um, like a de facto sort of post your own videos and hopefully someone on, on the site might pick you up basically yeah. and I think that's kind of how the blog section eventually became. So I think a lot of people know is that yeah it, it was more about video than it was writing articles. Right, it was like a big sort of big collection of, of 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 people auditioning to be to, to be found to be to be picked up by by them and yeah it, it was a fact it was effectively like an unspoken audition process yeah, yeah. basically at least in the fairly early years of the site yeah I, I i remember back then it was it was this huge like when youtube was exploding doug walker jane rolf uh, J J jane rolf james rolf J jane <laughs> jane jane rolf is his wife apparently jane rolf reviewing jane austen movies. exactly <laughs> um that's a free idea i'm just throwing out there <laughs> th there was this this huge wave and there's still a bit of fallout mm. nowadays of people critiquing things and being very angry yes. and and negative and of course during bad movie beat it's it's bad movie beatdown not 
movie yeah. discussion show. So what, why do you think people just gravitated so much, whether, whether creator or audience? What, why do they gravitate so much to critiquing things and being negative? I think because they found it funny, honestly. I mean, that's that's kind of how I felt about it at the time. I thought, yeah, this is this is funny. I mean, you're you're writing critique, but you're also writing comedy at the same time, and that kind of gives you a like an in, as it were, because it it allows you to kind of essentially write material around the movie and kind of show off your abilities. And I think that a lot of people kind of saw what James and Doug and various others were doing around that time, and they kind of thought hey we want in especially because the barrier to entry for online video isn't that high and it has got higher in the decade or so since i mean the video quality of stuff that i put out a decade ago i sort of wince at like but, you know, <laughs> but back then that was sort of acceptable enough as it were so um so basically uh a lot of people kind of saw what doug and james were doing and saw it as attainable in some way because they were they were doing it in their own homes and with their own friends and so forth so that seems like the kind of ideal for many people it doesn't seem like work it seems almost like an extension of basically a hobby so mm -hmm. in that way i can see why so many people gravitate towards it because they they thought it was funny and they also thought hey i could probably do the same so when you're reviewing a movie, especially when you're when you're negatively reviewing a movie, how do you decide or find the the appropriate balance between an actual mm. objective critique of a bad thing in a movie or taking the bad thing and doing some comical performance negative scream into a pillow kind of thing? Like how, how, how do you know which one yeah. to pick? Yeah, that's always kind of the balance that one has to strike with that kind of thing, because a lot of the reviewers at that time were sort of characters and things like that. And I think I differentiate myself a little bit in that I didn't really have a quote unquote character. It was basically an extension of myself, a, a really kind of, at times, very kind of exaggerated version of myself but almost sort of like an alter ego as it were i think that a lot of internet personalities you meet them in real life and they're kind of unassuming types and then you kind of get a camera in front of them and suddenly they're like all oh, big and really all over the place and they get really animated you know that sort of thing <laughs> so that that's i i but i i never wanted to kind of do it as a character because i i felt even early on like the definition of kind of well i'm not saying this it's my character saying this i always thought that was a bit of a weird thing like why, why are you writing things that you don't mean you know you're putting this out there in a video why are you saying things in character are you pretending to have an opinion that you think someone else might agree with you with like just write your own opinion and so that was kind of the the approach that I gave it when I was writing the episodes is that they were always kind of my direct thoughts and so I would I would kind of phrase it in sort of a joke but I would I would mean what I would say most of the time I would I'm most of the time I wasn't trying to be facetious with my commentary so I was trying to kind of balance between actually saying what I wanted to about the movies as a critique and actually having that substance there and then making sure that it was kind of funny at the same time. And I do think that that balance, it, it very much fluctuated while I was doing the show because some episodes would be a bit more comedic heavy and then some episodes I would lean a bit more on the sort of critique side of things. I think a lot of people kind of liked that I went into the kind of more technical nitty gritty of stuff, and especially when it came to the sort of direct video seat that fair like the Seagal movies or the Snipes movies where they you know the body doubling and things like that and the kind of the the corner cutting of that me kind of highlighting that 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 has a kind of a rich vein of comic potential but also it's interesting to talk about because it's kind of like a peek behind the scenes as it were but I do think um I think a couple of years in I kind of lost myself a little bit in the in the mix because I there was, there was a time a few years down the line where Doug temporarily quit and I felt like there was a lot of pressure on me to kind of adopt a similar persona as it were kind of fill in Doug's space and that wasn't really me 
but I felt because Doug, his style is very Daffy Duck as he describes it. So it's very kind of really hyper exaggerated and shrill and kind of screaming. And I think you can see that start to creep in around what I label as the kind of fifth and the latter half of the fourth season episodes where I start getting very angrier and I start getting a little bit shriller and and after a while I just kind of burnt out from from that I kind of had to stop for a while and just kind of go back to basics really kind of almost reset myself as it were like okay bring it back to me now because that it was it was really draining to keep doing that and also people were starting to be like you're 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 really kind of affecting your voice and it doesn't sound like you anymore and and i kind of agree with them honestly when i was starting to look back at it i was going no this this is too much this is really kind of monotonous and kind of it's a bit too intense and so i really kind of dialed it back after that and got it back to somewhere that's kind of more approachably me like it's still like what i'm doing now is still a, an ex like a like a kind of expanded version of myself a more i guess a more confident version of myself that kind of projection as it were but it's not it's not like completely divorced from my own personality and that's not to say that those that period of videos wasn't but uh it's still i think in in many ways i think it brings it back down to you know ground level as opposed to trying to make every line into like this big explosive thing like that gets tiresome very quickly and so i think that i got even though i didn't have a character i was starting to kind of become this weird character and yeah yeah that you you, you fall down that rabbit hole and that's a that that kind of that kind of can suck you right up. But I think I, I like to think that I kind of pulled myself out of that quicksand. I'm reminded of your review of, I think it was Seven Pounds, the, that Will Smith movie, mm. where I'm um, thinking about it now. I'm not sure if, if I would e even call it a funny video or a funny review because you actually delve into the morals of the actual story. And it, it's, it's, it's always good to see a, a, a reviewer who's known for uh maybe being over the top and like not i'm, I'm not re referencing you specifically but mm. any, any reviewer yeah. who is over the top swears a lot does a, a lot of crazy things and then suddenly they sort of bring it down and they give an actual objective critique to, to something it's mm. always really refreshing to to know and understand that you're listening to a person who actually has opinions on something and they're not just a jokester on camera Right, exactly. And that's that's the thing about having the actual critique there is that I wanted a little bit of actual substance to it so that you watched it and you really kind of understood why these movies didn't work. Like, yeah, they're funny to talk about, but there is also kind of like a serious point like, oh, you could actually watch these hopefully and maybe learn something about how how you know film works and that was the kind of idea that I wanted to have is that I wanted it to be approachable because I feel like a lot of film criticism uh, at least back in the day, it used to be this very kind of, I guess, closed off kind of community. And it was very, I guess, sort of dry and educational. So there is that kind of shift there. And in some senses, I think that the the shift to the sort of angry persona was a little bit of, like a bad thing. That, like some things have come out of that that I don't necessarily agree with. But I do, the, I do think that you you need to have like a real backbone to your critique like you need to stand by what you're saying and actually judge the movie fairly i was i would always try and judge a movie fairly and it was never when i was covering a movie i would always pick ones where i genuinely felt the way that i did about them i wasn't trying to go well this person has requested me to do this so i have to feel this way about this movie you go into that mindset and that's a bad mindset to look at any movie because then you're not actually critiquing what you're seeing on screen you're critiquing what you would imagine someone is saying about that movie or you're trying you're looking for ways to exaggerate things whereas the movies that i picked i i would have i would watch them and i would immediately go in 10 minutes usually okay this this one might be one that i kind of feel this way about and kind of be interested in talking about and 
because and I think that usually the way that that's kind of manifests itself is that usually there is a theme or an idea that kind of unsettles me or there's that I feel that there's something kind of objectionable about the movie in some way and seven pounds is a good example of that where I watched that movie and I thought this this is really kind of harmful in its messaging and also just kind of shameless in Will Smith's attempt to just gain an Oscar so I kind of I kind of approached it from that position of oh well this is this is kind of really wrong so I won't and but I knew that that movie was dealing in very heavy subject matter so it was again it was that case of balancing critique and the comedy and dealing with the tone of the movie as well and trying to be respectful to the issues without so by critiquing the movie without kind of trivializing or kind of you know making fun of very serious subject matter so that was the that was really the the demand of that particular video i remember being really really nervous about that video actually when it first came out because obviously it's a much more subdued video at least in terms of the output i was putting out at that time and so I genuinely thought that it was going to get a backlash because I'd been stung before by backlash when I reviewed Equilibrium the year prior. I thought I was going to get the same thing there. And it turns out, no, it didn't for the most part, at least not back then. A lot of people seem to agree with me. Uh, I think now that's kind of shifted a little bit. When I reposted that on YouTube, a lot of people that, that search for reviews of things on YouTube, they want to have their opinions validated. And because uh, I'm talking about seven pounds in this very derogatory way, I've got a lot of fans of that movie going, well, you just don't understand it. You don't understand the movie. You're, you're, and I'm like, no, that wasn't, that wasn't the aim at all, really. That wasn't, like, I, like, that's fair if you don't like the movie, but even so, I mean, it's fair if you like the movie, but even so, I, I felt very strongly about the way that certain subject matters were represented in it. So, but yeah, I do think that uh, some people, they take they take the videos a little bit more to personally than perhaps they should do mm. in some cases. <laughs> you just uh, you just don't understand the complexities of Will Smith screaming in a car to get an Oscar. Yeah, you don't understand the, the, the complexities of a man having a box jellyfish so that he can oh God. sacrifice himself <laughs> in a bath. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I remember, yeah. It's like, the, the, the I just found that movie just shameless, just <laughs> shameless in its manipulation of the audience. And all movies are meant to kind of, you know, pull on your emotions in some way but i felt felt like that it, it, the, the seven pounds feels like the kind of movie where someone's grabbing you by the shoulders and shaking you like do you feel something here feel sad about this <laughs> you know? it, in the early days of your online movie reviewing how did you find these movies because there's i mean there's something to be said about seeing uh any asylum movie like Mega Shark versus Giant Octopus or Transmorphers, you can just pick that up and say, this is going to be crap. A video is on the way. But something like Seven Pounds, e Equilibrium, how, like, do you, do you watch it because you want to see it and then you go, oh, I'll make a video out of this? Or do you, how, how do you search for, for things to talk about? Honestly, I just kind of works from kind of two uh, mindsets in that I was, I was very kind of cine aware so I knew I was aware of a lot of movies but I'd also kind of be involved in a lot of forums and bad movie sites and things like that so I'd have a little bit of an idea from kind of hearsay and then the other thing is that I would go to Poundland the UK equivalent of a dollar store or things like that and I would pick up uh, any movie that looked like it was you know reasonably well made you know sort of high production value that was the sort of time where dvds were starting to get so readily available that you'd find you know kind of these excess copies for a quid so a lot of the movies that i f that i reviewed were ones that i actually found in pound shops and things like that so that that kind of was a good way of kind of finding movies i mean nowadays i i guess the selection process would be a lot different because you could go on a streamer basically and kind of try and find stuff and go into the weeds that way but yeah though the selection process would always be i would i would reject a lot more than i'd actually review 
because you know there's a lot of bad movies that are just boring or they're not interesting or they're well made or they weren't actually that bad you know and mm. so th those would be on the on the rejects pile and that's i guess that's a similar process to say something like mystery science theater 3000 where they they would kind of go through movies and kind of search through the tapes as it were the like loads and loads of these kind of public domain movies you know they try and find the, the juiciest cuts as it were i mean at least at least i didn't do anything like mystery science theater 3000 did where they watched half a movie and then realized oh this is this got suddenly got really dark in the second half like yeah. that, that 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 ended up being a bit bad for them but yeah i always watch the movies uh all the way through and usually in the process of it i would watch them at least several times to I, what I would do in my scripting process to try and make sure that it was as accurate to the movie as possible is that essentially I would watch it, I guess, live, as it were. So I would watch the movie, pause when I got to talking about something, write the, write the joke, write the sort of, you know, the kind of setup to it and the kind of translating of the story and then unpause, get to the next bit. And so kind of write sort of writing notes but writing script and notes simultaneously kind of making that process as one and then kind of refining it and then sometimes if i if there was a problem i would go, kind of go back and especially in editing i would sometimes go back and i would refine that even further i'd like to know more about your early channel awesome days uh, from from someone who was there and and behind the scenes because after mm. after you after you were picked up can can you tell us about how how was it wor uh, wor working for the company for the first couple of years? And how how were things scheduled, and what were the procedures like? Um, so the way that the, the site works is that I didn't really have that much of a behind the scenes access to it because obviously I'm in the UK and a lot of that was all mm. based out of Chicago and so forth. So the way that I would um, so initially, the way that videos were scheduled is that you'd literally have to send an email to um, Mike Machard and and hopefully get the video like scheduled for that particular day. And then eventually they got this uh, this backsite essentially for all the contributors to kind of take their spots. And I think that was five at first, and then I think it expanded to seven or eight but you used to have to kind of schedule and then later on they brought in this rule that you had to make two videos a month otherwise you were you were being penalized or eventually let go of the site so you had to unless you kind of talked in advance saying okay i can't i can't make two videos this month things have come up in some way so that's that's kind of how the site sort of operated at least in the background so a lot of the creators weren't directly involved with what was going on in Chicago. A lot of that was kind of onto itself. And so a lot of the, a lot of the people involved with the websites as creators, a lot of them were just kind of acting independently. I almost saw Channel Awesome more as a distributor more than anything. They had very little input over my work. They didn't make decisions like you had to cover that movie or anything like that. They, you know, it was basically I made the video and I would I would just schedule it on the back end, I guess, in the same way that, you know, YouTube is, is kind of my distributor now, basically, is that, you know, they I would just make a video and I would post it up on YouTube. And, you know, I've, that's basically it. I mean, the, the difference, of course, being that all the videos back then were hosted on Blip. So technically they were kind of an affiliate website. They were linking to the uploads on blip at the time uh, although originally it was reaver a very short-lived uh collaboration with reaver because reaver didn't Never pay anyone <laughs> i i remember blip but i, I don't remember reaver mm. hasn't blip just yeah, blown up and disappeared for years yeah bl into it. yeah blip blip's gone now blip okay. blip is r.i.p blip mm. uh, there were some good times with blip mm. especially in the ad sense the the ad revenue from blip was was great at one point let me tell you <laughs> but um well can you tell us what happened to blip uh what happened with blip is that blip got bought out by a company called maker and maker had no real interest in blip but they wanted the technology behind 
blip. They wanted their infrastructure for video streaming because they wanted to launch their own video platform. So that's why they bought blip, not because they wanted the craters or anything like that, because they just wanted, you know, the, the, the way of, you know, playing videos. So they got bought by maker and then maker not long after that got bought by Disney. <laughs> so, mm. And then Disney decided, well, we're not really interested in any of this stuff. So they shut down maker and they shut down blip by extension. So yeah, it, <laughs> that's how that, that's how that happened. But yeah, there used to be a lot of ads back in the day on Blip that paid exceptionally well. I mean, mm. there is there is there was a lot of ads on Blip that were quite annoying. None of the ads were localized for British audiences, so that but so there, it was interesting seeing a lot of American ads. And there was there was definitely some annoying ads at the time. Like I remember the the stand up ads that were ostensibly meant to be themed around like food items that were just terrible several minutes of stand-up i remember there was a starburst campaign that were basically like cg starburst rock stars those would go on for several minutes and those paid absurdly well <laughs> <laughs> so how did it feel finally when you were using blip to well to to get paid to make the videos it was good it was nice to feel like i was i was uh independent in some way because obviously all my checks came from blip they didn't come from channel awesome i was making my own ad revenue all channel awesome was doing was basically hosting the videos on their website mm -hmm. so i was getting you know my my cut from the videos and that it was a good feeling because honestly it propped me up for a good few years especially when because i was managing going through uni at the same time and I know that a lot of my, my friends were kind of struggling with that. And the, the videos actually put me through uni. I kind of, I was always kind of in good stead because the videos kind of, I, I, I really did kind of work hard actually, because I was doing the uni stuff in the day and then I would go back home and, and do all the video stuff. So I was basically kind of doing two jobs simultaneously, essentially. So yeah, the, but it was it was it was yeah it was it was good at the, at the time it was it was decent well we we can't talk about your time with uh channel awesome without talking about the movies because you were in uh yeah. <laughs> kick, kick ass suburban nights and and to boldly flee uh, just generally as as someone who had to fly to america to do it what was it like collaborating on those those movies uh, honestly it was a bit overwhelming it was so i i think i was meant to be a part of the of the brawl the very first anniversary mm -hmm. thing but i couldn't fly out because uh, you know i had other obligations so i couldn't really fly out at the time so uh i was a bit more free around the time of kickassia so they invited me again and i said yes and that was kind of a big thing because i really hadn't traveled at that point i been you know like to Tenerife maybe a decade beforehand but I hadn't done any flying by myself ever or any solo traveling so that was that was a very big deal um and I remember being very overwhelmed by that actually I remember being in what was it San Francisco airport and it was and I had a moment where the where the sheer magnitude of what I'd done <laughs> I'd I kind of like oh oh shit <laughs> i i am literally here on the other side of the world and <laughs> just hoping that i that i'm all fine basically um and then i remember i remember having to get a connecting flight to reno and i could hear the plane going <laughs> you know all the sounds that you don't want to hear on an airplane especially if you've never really flown before and, it, and i just hear the pilot go Okay, we're going to have to uh, decommission the aircraft. Uh, so we all had to get off the plane and wait for them to bring another plane. Luckily, it was all fine. Flew to Reno, completely fine. Reno itself was a very weird experience because obviously Reno, near Las Vegas, uh, very much a gambling place. And to such an extent where you walk out of the plane and the first thing you see in the airport terminal is you see slot machines <laughs> right there in front of you. So yeah, the 
and I, I believe the first person I met was Lewis. Lewis was the Lewis was the person that was waiting for me, and he was waiting for me because obviously my my plane got delayed. So they were kind of like, okay, we need to have someone at the airport waiting for when he does actually arrive. And so I, Lewis was the first person I met, and it was in it was nice to actually meet everyone. And I would say one of the benefits of the time there, that one of the things that you know has has at least some good has come out of that whole situation is that I met a lot of people that you know I would consider to be friends for life there is a lot of people that I still talk to to this day that I really love and adore that are, you know just really good people and I always I've always felt like a kind of like an outcast in some way I kind of grew up very kind of I guess isolated in some ways so it was nice to kind of have kind of like a like a tribe almost and that being on the website meant that i was in the sort of gravitational field of a lot of very like-minded people that kind of came from similar backgrounds like myself and it was nice to finally kind of find i guess a, a you know a sort of people as it were and we you know it the movies were kind of secondary uh i i would so when i when it came to doing the movies I, I would try and take my my role kind of seriously in that I would I would treat it like an acting job like okay I'm I'm here to act and I'm here to do my job and just really give it my all you know that this is this is what is demanded of me so I, I I wouldn't half ass it and I think that's pretty clear in the performances um but yeah the 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 main the main thing for me was actually just getting to meet all those people every year i mean even if the circumstances got more trying because obviously the the films kind of bubbled a little bit too much I, in my opinion but it was the the idea was what do you mean really what do you mean they bubbled what does that mean I, I I would I would say that you know the, the movies kind of over expanded themselves. I mean, you get to Kickassia, which is basically a, like a hundred minute fan film for the website, and mm -hmm. that's kind of about the right length or so. And then Suburban Nights kind of ex kind of leans more into this kind of grand mythology mm -hmm. of the websites, and you're like, mm, I don't know about that. And then the length kind of expands out, and then you get to Devoldly Flea, which is just yeah <laughs> what over three hours long and kind of a mm. monument to doug's ego <laughs> like, yeah that that yeah, seems really to be over expanded the, yeah that that seems to be a, a common opinion on 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 the movies where the the first one the brawl for what it was it was essentially perfect it, it was it was exactly what it needed to be a bunch of internet weirdos in a room beating each other up and it's 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 funny, Kick Assia. In my opinion, I think that Kick Assia is actually kind of great because because it too is what it should have been—a bunch of internet weirdos doing a small thing in a big way, and it's really funny and and mm. and, and and funny. Um, Suburban Nights had a lot of that as well. It just got a little too serious with the whole magical thing. When when things started to get a little serious, it's like ah, uh, you got to mm. pull it. You'll be like. Yeah, your, your, yeah. Your, your internet weirdos. You got to stick with the with the internet weirdos thing, and then and then to boldly flee. It just got a little too serious. Now I I like I I like the movies. I used to come home from high school and watch the movies. And of course, as you alluded to, these not not these movies were really big deals. But were, what were also really big deals were the collaborations that happened around yes. around them. Th those those easily like combined together rivaled the epicness of, of of these internet movies how how did you how did you get collaborating with people who who's in charge when it comes to a collaboration honestly it was it was ourselves uh, most of the time because the the collaborations um would kind of come out organically like we talk to each other on skype and there would be things that i would i would watch and i would go okay I would earmark that if I wanted to work with that person, I would go, okay, I'll, I'll save that for that person. Cause I think it would work with them. Like that's how, um, sort of Sunday school musical worked. I kind of earmarked that for Todd. Cause I thought that might work for him and so forth. And for example, um, Hercules in New York, I thought that would be a good thing for me and Alison to collaborate on. So we'd kind of work out these collaborations and then, uh, the way that I would do a, uh, like a crossover script is that I would 
make sure to give the, the guest collaborator first dibs, essentially. So they would send me their notes uh, to incorporate into a script that I would write. So they would get the, the first pass of it, essentially. So they would point out the things that would be important to them, and then I'd work myself around them, basically. Because I, my, my feeling when I was doing a collaboration is that People aren't really seeing me. They're really seeing the, the other collaborator and they want they want to see them and get them shown off. So I would kind of give most of the lines shared to them in all honesty. That would be what I would try to do. So that would that would be how I would go through a scripting process. The the actual collaborations themselves, uh, I remember that being a very heated point actually, because obviously they they flew us all out and i believe they started doing the kind of deal like oh you have to you have to do collaborations because we'll post them on our blip channel we'll get the revenue from it so essentially you were working on the crossovers for free which is a bit crap but at least you know i'm held on to the crossovers in hindsight like onto boldly fully for example there was three crossovers so basically i think michelle or someone said that oh well, you get two crossovers and then you can get whatever you do from that afterwards to yourself. So basically, I, I set myself the target of, OK, I'm, I'm making three then. I, I will make three almost as an act of spite. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I, I did, what was it, Iron Hero, uh, Leave of Extraordinary Gentleman, and Alvin and the Chipmunks, the Sweet Call, and I deliberately left the Sweet Call as my one just to be like, yeah, I know that that one's going to get the views and the revenue, and it did. <laughs> uh <-huh>. um, <laughs> so, but yeah, that that was kind of a bit rubbish, and I believe that was something that was noted in the document, as it were, because it's it, it wasn't very fair. Like, I, I, I understand it. The, the crossover movies were a big expense, but I feel like that was an unfair thing to put on creators, especially because, you know, working on videos is, is time-consuming. You want recompense for your efforts essentially and and yeah it, it it was a bit of a crummy situation in that respect so and and that's the thing with all the channel awesome stuff like that like i you know there are good things came out of that but there was a lot of bad stuff and yeah so yeah, well, you 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 left in uh, 2018, if if my if yeah. my research is is correct. Now, I that that is correct. I probably good. should have left sooner. In all honesty, I well, probably should, that is one of my regrets, actually. Well, I I ask this not really to pull any drama out of anywhere, because honestly, mm. I don't know what happened. I actually stopped watching Channel Awesome like a year or two before all that stuff happened. So this is coming from someone who genuinely doesn't know anything about what happened from your behind the scenes perspective. Um, ha hashtag change the channel, the document. What are these things? So change the channel and the, 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 the document that came out of that was uh, basically a lot of crazes that were on the websites that were, the, the management had really not well the website was not very well run and there was a feeling after to boldly flee that many of the creators were just kind of left to their own devices and th the management was not really interested in them they were interested in what was going on in chicago with doug and all that and so it was just kind of felt like there wasn't very much kind of engagement with the other creators and there would be things that would be promised that would never materialize and so there would be a lot of that going on and so that was that had been kind of under the surface for quite a few years in all honesty and then there was the fact that there would be times where they just act, treat creators terribly there were creators that left because of the way that they were treated by the management and so I think what happened was is that people started talking about that uh, that website where you had to book all your slots on videos and how that was the same website that had existed for eight years straight without almost any changes and was buggy and glitchy and all sorts. And then that just kind of escalated into people just talking about how, you know, the, how bad things were 
in all honesty like yes i from my own perspective i i had that kind of freedom and independence but i also felt like i was neglected it never felt like i was being promoted or pushed in any way it never felt like there was anything happening from that they, were, they felt like there was a stagnancy going on so but after after that kind of twitter discussion uh, many of the former many of the creators that were on the website and former creators who were still friends with each other and still are to this day they they kind of started working on this document talking hope and the idea behind the document was really to try and change the management honestly was to try and change the thinking like hopefully maybe apologize for some of these things in the past and maybe change the way that the, the site was run and hopefully for the better because at the time of the document you know it was a site that had 30 creators on it alongside doug you know it was a it was a big hub but you know it's you know they they wrote the document and the document has a lot of things in it and there was stuff in the document that even i didn't know about i i didn't know about a lot of stuff because honestly i was just going around doing things on my own devices and so there was there was things in the document that genuinely shocked me and upset me honestly and then i they there was that initial response where basically the company said we're sorry that you felt that way and when they put out their response i read that and i went okay well i'm leaving and i just sat in the bath thought about what i was gonna write and i left and that was basically it and i i really should have left sooner honestly because i like a lot they they hurt like i personally wasn't too affected by them but i knew people that were and you know though and i feel like i i like i let my like i let those friends down in some way because i was still on the website honestly but yeah i i should have left sooner than i did i think the the writing was on the wall with regards to that that there was you know people were shifting onto youtube at that time i should have really concerted more into my efforts in that direction rather than trying to maintain ties with the website honestly so i think and i i, I feel like the the it, it you know it could the website you know you look at the website now in retrospect and all the people that came off of that website and, and found even greater success on youtube you think how many people are on that website and what the the, the ability and the talent of those people and how much they didn't utilize that and that that is a that is an absolute shame that is a that is a real shame they could have made they could have done something really great and i think for maybe a couple of years they they had something great and then they just kind of let slip through their fingers through bad management and bad decisions and j just really really poor choices it and it, it really hurt a lot of people it genuinely did like to this day there are still people that are affected by things that happened on there and i know there are people that like to gawk and laugh like oh i mean it used to be on channel awesome huh huh well it, you know it's it, it's it was at least a you know a good exposure at the time you know i and that's that's the conflicting thing is that i i wouldn't be here now if i wasn't on the website but at the same time there is the fact that that is a really kind of you know toxic environment that was a toxic environment uh, that it, it is what it was and so you know it, it was good that i think that i managed to find an audience through them but me being on that website doesn't define me and i feel like my, my since i left i have really kind of I, I guess refound my voice again in certain respects and i've found a different audience that doesn't know me from from that so i feel like you know it, the the whole fallout from the document you know it, it was a good thing because i think that many creators felt like they they were empowered by it and it, it it's a shame that the website you know that things ended up the way they did but yeah you know it i think we're all better off not being there what i picked up on 
uh, in my limited knowledge on on this, is that after To Boldly Flee, when Doug decided to not be the nostalgia critic, apparently he didn't tell anyone that he was he was doing that. Uh, is is that is nope. that right? Right. That is so, absolutely and right. It, Initially, I was I was thinking to myself, well, he he's his own person do, doing his own show. He he doesn't need to tell any, any, anybody things. But then I thought to myself, well, a lot of people are going to Channel Awesome to see the nostalgia critic, and then that audience bleeds off into other people. So because he left without telling anybody, all these other people were sort of were just left abandoned. They 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 yes. couldn't they couldn't get their things in order to the to get get their audience and and move somewhere else and yeah you you said yes so apparently that's all that's all true that that is absolutely the case we did not know about that until we got a copy of the script which was maybe a fortnight before i, I seem to recall it was like the working draft was something like space hole the search for plot or something like that and the first immediate impression i got was this is 240 pages. You want us to film 240 pages in 10 days? They've expanded the shooting schedule onto Boldly Flee because obviously they knew it would be longer. But even so, 10 days is ridiculous for what is basically over three hours. And so, the, the you know, it was a really kind of hellish shooting schedule for a lot of people. I think it, the, the, the filming of To Boldly Flee broke a lot of people honestly because it was really hard work i remember very one day in particular was a super long day because they'd scheduled about half the scenes in the movie that was set in doug's house on one day and like it was almost impossible to get through all that in one day so basically you know you're you know you you're doing this kind of really super long day until almost the wee hours of the morning trying to bash out these scenes and I remember that, you know, uh, there, there, there's a scene where I have to come in and console someone and I wasn't meant to be in that scene. That was because they'd accidentally sent someone home that was meant to be in that scene. So basically I had to learn all the lines on the spot. I remember because of the sheer size of the script, I actually gave up reading it. I didn't read it from start to finish. I basically went, you know, sort of, a, you know, find film brain in the script and just went and found my parts in the script so that I basically focused on my material. I think we all knew at the time that it was going to be this this kind of over expanded uh, disaster at least and I think that's but we, at least from my experience again I just knuckled down I just basically went okay I'm focusing on my stuff I will try and do the best job that I can with my material and that's basically what I attempted to do and I remember I remember uh, being slightly involved in the uh, ever so slightly involved in the process in that so I remember Doug while he was writing the script he sent me a message saying did you want to have a more dramatic role this time out and I said yeah sure that that sounds interesting and I think that you, that is one of the things that at least I can take away from Tobolby Flea is that it's, there was a little joke among the other contributors, like, you're the only one aside from Doug in these movies that kind of gets an arc. <laughs> you, know? It's I, you know, I kind of go from this, uh, this big over-exaggerated kid to kind of having this, this I, I, you know, kind of hero moment and kind of having this, this kind of growing maturity through you know by to boldly flee i thought that was at least interesting and i tried to you know take that responsibility as much as i could like maybe i can save my scenes at the very least because yeah, so. in 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 suburban nights you were the the sycophant character right yes well it was like that in um in kickassia mm. and that was kind of the so the way that that spawned was um, I know that a lot of people kind of go, oh, well, they, they did treat film brain dirty. And I, I, I don't think I felt that at the time. Maybe there are days occasionally where I sometimes feel like that. There are people that kind of seem to think that those anniversary movies were a documentary. <laughs> like those were actually our personalities or something like that. Like, no, I, I hardly spoke to Doug between movies in all honesty. But I am um, the, you know, the... 
the way that came about is that I was basically the youngest person on the site at that time. So they basically wrote me as the kid. And I fully embraced that because I kind of came from, uh, I, I used to take drama for, for school. So um, for drama, we used to do a, a play called Blue Remembered Hills. And if you're not familiar with Blue Remembered Hills, that's basically um, adult performers acting as children. Uh, you know, it's a kind of a dark play, obviously. So, so I kind of uh, created like this childlike persona for for that, and then I kind of adapted that for for the kind of comedy playing of it, like basically kind of really sort of exaggerating. Like you, like I like I would raise my voice a little bit higher than what I would normally speak at, you know, kind of to seem like a little bit more hyperactive and childlike, you know, just sort of really like raise it up, and you know, and then obviously that's not my speaking voice as you can tell <laughs> but but that was that was the performance so that 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 was basically the mindset behind that and yeah there are people that that kind of you know go on about those movies you know still to this day but you know i i i tried my best with what i was given <laughs> yeah yeah i i'd say suburban nights that was your movie you were you were so funny in in, in the movie uh, actually you know literally every yeah, me, me, me and kinley we had we had so much fun working mm -hmm. on that movie just kind of bouncing off each other doing the, the harry potter thing it was it was yeah. a lot of fun and honestly it's kind of funny actually because i'm not I, I i've not watched any harry potter or anything but uh, it was kind of you know fun to, but i wasn't playing harry potter i was playing me pretending to be dressed up as harry <laughs> potter and doing all these kind of silly things and i i like the thing i liked about doing the acting in the anniversary movies is that it was very different from what i was doing on my show because it provided an outlet it provided me the kind of i guess a, a chance to expand my range a little bit in that uh, i grew up kind of watching jim carrey and things like that and so the, that was me kind of be doing my little channeling of jim carrey there you know <laughs> so and I think sometimes I ad-libbed on those movies and it would find their way into the edit. I would really kind of uh, just kind of run with whatever I was thinking at that particular moment. Uh, I, I believe uh, in Kikassia there was a moment that absolutely killed everyone because of the way that I delivered it where um, uh, Santa Christ is on the floor <laughs> oh, and I yeah. have to yeah, run yeah. in and I turn over and I halfway through my line I just go, Santa Christ, no! <laughs> and i think because of the way that i delivered that it no one expected me to deliver it that way with that mm -hmm. kind of intensity <laughs> so it was, hey i heard a Santa Christ, no <laughs> see that's a, that's a little funny moment but yeah 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 it was it was basically tr just trying to keep my head above water essentially you, you in in suburban nights you you saying the other one had sand castles that line is is burnt into my in, into my brain every, every <laughs> like three months i just say it out loud for fun for, for, for fun the other one had sand castles uh yeah it, see that's the thing it, uh, that was a scripted line but it, mm -hmm. it, you know it's just all in the delivery <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So for the sake of nostalgia, for the past like six months, year, I've been going back to all of the collaborations from the Channel Awesome people. And, you know, some of these are a decade old. And when I was yeah, yeah. a decade younger, look, at when I was a decade younger watching them, I used to think to myself, well, all of these people are between the ages of 18 and 32 and they're always going to be that age forever but then a couple yeah, months ago yeah. i looked up uh in information about spoonie noah and it said that mm. he was born in 1980 and initially I, I went oh yeah of course that makes sense given his uh style the movies that he's into sure fair enough and then i thought wait hang on 1980 it's 2022 is spoonie is Spoonie now 42 years old? That's yeah. so weird. Thinking about Spoonie yeah, that's, that's being 42. The, that, is, that, is, 
that is the thing about the internet. People seem to think that you're kind of frozen in time, as it mm. were, because they, they know you for the one thing. Yeah. I think that a lot of people on the internet, they fall into that trap that they get known for the one thing, and that's the one thing that they're always going to be known for on the internet. And that's not how people work. People change and evolve over time. People grow old. I, I get, uh, you know, I periodically get comments going, mm, you didn't age very well, did you? Mm, good. That was necessary but you know <laughs> you've, you've got a mighty beard going on yeah this is a kind of a, a pan a pandemic beard that kind of grew out I'm, I'm still undecided as to whether i'm permanently keeping it but uh it, people have responded well to it at the very least <laughs> but um yeah you know people people change and i i feel like i have changed I think you can see that in my work, the the approach and style and the technicals have obviously massively changed as well. You know, and I think that if if the internet needs to get better at doing it, it needs to remember that uh, just because, you know, someone has become a meme or something like that, they are they are not permanently <laughs> that. They are they are something else, yeah. as it were. So I think you know it's it's interesting. Uh, and you say that it's a decade old. Uh, it's funny going I, I had to go back and re-air a lot of those episodes to put them on YouTube because of, you know, co content ID. Again, Blip is a different world. You know, that was less of a concern. Whereas, obviously, nowadays, that is, you know, always a, pro always a priority when I'm editing the video. It's like, okay, I need to limit the amount of footage here. And that's why some of the way that I do things has changed, where it's more on me on camera. And I remember, uh, as, a, as like, psychologically, that was a... That was a thing that kind of made me nervous when I used to do the projected videos back in the day where I'd have to carry them more because I didn't have enough footage. That would always make me incredibly nervous. And I'm, I still get nervous about that to this day because it still feels like you're on the spot to a certain extent. But I'm better at it now. And I think you can see that evolution of confidence in there where I get more self-assured with mm. being on camera and being the focus of the video, as it were. So the idea is you know the, the the reviews are not meant to be a replacement for watching the movie itself and i would really encourage people like if they saw the video and they were even slightly interested in the movie just watch the movie as well and it might give you a different perspective on the video or it might or you might find that the video kind of enhances your, your viewing experience of the movie i always feel like that's something that i want to encourage like watch the movies honestly what watch movies i that that is the that is the main goal that i want to put out there is just to encourage people to watch movies and think more critically about them and enjoy them and so yeah so that's that's basically why i've kind of evolved over time and you know i like a lot of the lot, some of the people that i met from the anniversary movies i didn't uh, keep track of or some people have kind of severed ties but there were people that have that, that I have kept in touch with that I talk to on a daily basis, and they are I I would consider them my my best friends, like honestly. And we we've all gone through this weird shared experience together. But that that they, they are people that I genuinely adore and care for. And you know, it's it that that was that was the good thing that came out of those days. Like that that that's the, that's the thing about. Uh, that I think you should treasure is like if you if you find your friends and like really find your friends, you should try and hold on to them at all costs. And I think the other thing that happened about the the kind of document was that it kind of showed who my friends actually were, and that that hurt in some ways. There were some people that I thought I was close to that I realized now I probably didn't actually know. And, you know, that's a, that's a terrible thing to realize, but I think everyone encounters that at some point or another, and you just got to try and move on and make the best of it. Yeah, and, and you have moved on because you're not doing bad movie beatdown anymore, and Projector, that's, that's happening all the time. And really, I think that you are, I'd say, one of the best people who are the best at saying scripted lines in a very natural casual way like it's it sounds like you're just saying what's on your mind now you you said that you had a that you built up your confidence what 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 would you say to someone who wants to speak as well as you um practice makes perfect uh -huh. you well, now you say that um so were you watching the projected videos and thinking they're scripted because they're not oh okay i mean they're they're, they're just so detailed 
I'm just so impressed. They're not. They're, they're, they, they are off the cuff. <laughs> okay, well, I guess you, you remember a lot then. Impressive. Yes. I, I, um, so the process with projector videos, the, the projector videos used to be scripted in the very early days where they were quite short. And then um, around 2016, where I started moving more into YouTube, I realized I had to do a format change if I was going to get past content ID and it was going to have to focus more on me. So I decided that it was that instead I was going to favor this approach where I was where it was kind of halfway between one of my scripted videos and halfway between a vlog. And so the the idea basically is that I'm speaking unscripted but trying but given the kind of professional polish and quality of a scripted video so the the process of filming a projector video is i'm normally filming for about two hours actually and normally what i'm doing is i'm kind of i would guess kind of describe it as writing on the fly you know i'm i am talking and i am writing in my head simultaneously and then if i screw up i go back to one and repeat it until it I, I get it confidently to deliver to camera. And I think because I am assured more in front of the camera, it doesn't really show very much that I'm kind of acting on my feet as it were. And I think part of that is just down to the fact that I've got more natural talking on camera. Like I think you can tell this from my extremely verbose <laughs> this, uh, answers that I can kind of run away with a thought if, if it's kind of in my head. And I usually have a good idea with a projector video of where I'm going, like this is the beat I'm going to hit and this is the next beat I need to hit and this is the next beat. So the idea is to try and talk as continuously as possible so that in editing I can, I can edit it down. So if I talk for about a minute or so, that means that I can get to a point where I can cut in the video, I can cut to B-roll or something like that, and then bridge it with the next portion of the video where I'm talking for a minute. So I kind of structure in my head like paragraphs, as it were, like, okay, this is this is, this is is one paragraph, and I'm talking about this thing. This is the next paragraph where I'm talking about something else. This is the next paragraph where I'm talking about something else. So that's kind of how I break it down. And it, it is a kind of a tough process. There are sometimes videos where I kind of get snagged on a thought or a, there's something i really want to deliver in a very specific way and then i find it tricky to kind of enunciate that or kind of perform that and then i kind of get into like this you, I'm, I'm sure many other people have found this where they just kind of get in this cycle where they're just stuck of like oh, i keep getting i keep screwing up the word or i keep screwing up the line and that's that's usually the problem with when i'm recording the projected videos is that i'm talking and then suddenly i'm like, oh, out of breath or oh, 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 you know trip over my tongue or things like that but so i so i kind of mix unscripted videos with scripted videos but it's always it's always like i knew i know what i'm saying i know exactly what i want to say for the most part sometimes sometimes there are movies i'm reviewing where i go i don't know quite where i'm gonna go with this but i have a feeling and some and sometimes I, I surprise myself with what I can come up with in the moment. Sometimes I, I surprise myself with, okay, actually this thought, if I run with this, yeah, that, that's actually something that I and so the way that I kind of I guess approach reviewing is it's a way of of uh kind of expressing the thoughts that I was thinking as I was watching the movie. So kind of it, it's almost like a recollection as it were it's like a okay i got a, i got how does this thing make me feel why does it make me feel this way and that's ba so it's almost like a report or on like a scene like i'm at the scene of this movie and this is what's happening you know and <laughs> yeah so that that's kind of the mindset that i go into and i try and add a little bit of humor in there as well you know some of my personality but you know not as much as the bad movie beat down stuff because of I, I think I gravitated towards a slightly more serious review show, and partly because I, I get a lot of I get comments on my old videos saying that they kind of find my on-screen personality a bit brash and a bit obnoxious. So I kind of dull that down somewhat to try and you know kind of you know make it seem a bit more kind of accessible in some way. Do you take notes when you're watching a movie to then look back at when you're talking about them? No, I don't. Oh. Actually. <laughs> yeah. uh, wow, if I have okay. to, if I have to, I have if I have to find things up, I usually, uh, I usually go to IMDb or or Wiki, and sometimes I watch the trailer as kind of like a refresher. But normally, I have quite a good sort of visual memory, 
some sometimes I do trip up, uh, some, and I'll just do like a like a sneaky punch in dub, as it were, or you know, cut away to B roll, and I will replace a line. Mm-hmm. You know, it, yeah, and that that's the control of editing. That's the that's what editing allows you to do. Is that uh, you know, you they say that uh, you write things three times. You write it while you're actually doing so. You write it while you're filming it, and you rewrite it again while you're editing mm-hmm. it. And that uh, that is absolutely true. In my case, I am all I am always in a process of writing and refining, mm-hmm. and always asking, okay, how can I make this better? How can I make this not not seem stuffy or puffed up or anything like that. I think it'd be, it, it is very easy as a film critic to suddenly kind of get all a bit pretentious or kind of get a bit dismissive, whereas I always try to be kind of as open-minded as possible. Like Even when it's a movie that's not aimed at me, like I have to, I go, you know, this is not aimed at me, but I kind of try to put myself in the shoes of the target audience for it. And I think that's I think that's when you're reviewing something, that's always something that you need to be mindful of. You need to be not only mindful of the audience, but what what is the filmmaker trying to say? If you can really understand what the filmmaker is intending to say, that really opens a lot of doors when it comes to reviewing things, because if they don't quite attain that, then you can illuminate what they were trying to do, but also what they might have you know why they might have fallen short of that so i feel like you know it's i kind of try to have a sort of almost empathetic process with my reviewing and that also might have come about from the fact that i am even more aware since on youtube that you know it's youtube everyone has access to youtube and everyone has access to twitter so occasionally I've had filmmakers of particularly small titles that I review, you know, they, they talk about, you know, times that I review things and often they're quite grateful that I've covered movies because, you know, a lot of the movies that I covered, you know, that they're different from the, the you know, from a lot of the stuff that's covered on YouTube. And that's, again, deliberate. I started out Bad Movie Beatdown doing movies that, you know, were different kinds of movies the ones that were usually being covered at that time and that continues to this day i you know it's it's a bit of a mix and match some movies you're probably already aware of some movies you don't but that's also the job of a film critic to make people aware of things that they might not necessarily have seen so yeah it's i'm, I'm I, i'd like to say that i've i've got a little bit prouder of what i'm doing i think there are some days where i get a little where i where i struggle with that sometimes but yeah i think i have I have, I, I have got to the point now where I where I look at my stuff and I go, no, no, actually, this this is actually quite good. This is you know, I, I'm very critical of my work as you can properly work out between the lines. But you know, I I, I I finish a video and then I can kind of disconnect from it after I finished it. I'll come back to it maybe a few months later and I'll look at it and I'll go, yeah, that was actually really good, wasn't it? That, I did actually say exactly what I wanted to say. Well, like, yeah, I, I'm I'm not completely terrible at this. <laughs> I guess after the years and years of, of of practice, you've you've just gotten better. Pra- pra- practice makes perfect, as you say. I mean, compare yeah. your your. I mean, I have been doing this for about a decade. If mm. I hadn't got better at it, I probably uh, should be looking elsewhere. Mm. But yeah, I... there's a lot. Of, I mean, there's a lot of things. Some again, some stuff I go. I really wish I learned that earlier. Like um. All this, uh, all this lighting and this microphone setup. Wish I learned some of that stuff earlier. You know, that's if if I have advice for anyone that's just starting YouTube, the advice that I would give is that you don't have to put everything you do out there. If you want to make videos, start small. It's just start making them for your friends. That's what um, James Rolfe did. He started making them for his friends, and then they eventually post them on the internet but i say if you're thinking of making videos for the internet just make them for yourself first of all and get to the point where you feel confident and you know you know what you're doing with regard to editing and things like that and then once you feel like you're ready then start releasing them because if you start out strong you'll build momentum so and I feel like YouTube is a really competitive environment. There's a lot of voices, you know, different niches. There are people who are famous on YouTube that I've never heard of before until they get famous or they appear on television. You know, YouTube is so massive. But if you have the confidence and the ability, you will stand out. That if you, 
if you find something that connects with people, that will, you know, that will explode you, basically. So you will go supernova very quickly. And the, the important thing is to keep your passion about it, is to keep being, you know, enthusiastic about what you're talking about. I feel like if you fall into this rabbit hole of talking about, oh, I, I've got to talk about this because it's popular. Mm, that's that's a trap that is honestly a trap but if you are genuinely sincerely interested in what you're talking about people know you know i think that's that's the way that people get successful on youtube is that something about their personalities connects with people when they they find them accessible so i i feel like if you're starting out on youtube just start out making them for yourselves refine your process and then when you have the confidence to do to actually put yourself out there that means you're in a much better position it's not like you're trying to fumble around with audio policy and things like that you're just you're just you and get all that stuff out of the way yeah this, this is why i recommend that everyone pick up some kind of hobby or passionate side ha uh, side, side hobby because you're never going to work harder on something than something that you're passionate about whether it's a job or not yeah, you you you've honestly got a flow with you. If you if you feel like there is something in you that's saying, "Oh, I need to do this," then chances are that's probably the thing you should be doing. Well, we can't talk about movies and seeing movies without talking about the, the horrible Black Death that has descended upon us for like two years now. God, it's getting old now. Yeah. Uh, during one of your uh, Q and As on December eighth, twenty twenty, you said something and I will say it right now and I want you to elucidate upon it. All right, here we go. <clears throat> you said the following. I do think that you need those actual physical spaces and the fact that in the last 20 years we've pushed them out is a tragedy because I think that it's making us a very hermitized people where people can be ignored and overlooked. Even as someone who is, who is online, there is a difference between being in an online space and being in a physical space a physical one, and it determines your interactions. Mm. I feel like you need actual physical spaces for being, for, I, I wrote the wrong thing. I feel like you need actual physical spaces to represent themselves, because otherwise that's no representation at all. Could you please elucidate yes. on the importance of physical spaces? I feel like physical spaces are really important um especially because i feel uh that's partly inspired by the fact that there there aren't very many places like video stores or film shops anymore it seems like a lot of that stuff has all moved online and part of that is the uh is the is the actual sort of process of things like netflix and things like that like rental is really moving to streaming because it's the most convenient way of doing that but we i feel like we have lost something in that because there are less spaces to congregate and I feel like the way that people carry themselves online can be very different to how they they are in public. And I feel like the, there is a disconnect that people have when they're online where they feel like, you know, we, the worst example of that is obviously people feel like that they can get away with anything, that they, they can talk to people in ways that they would never talk to anyone in real life. You know, they would, they would kind of do things like that. But also just generally because... You know, you can have all, I, I'm speaking kind of from personal experience, I have loads and loads of people that I'm really big friends with, but a lot of them aren't local, a lot of them are America and, and things like that, and so there are days where, you know, I kind of get a, a bit down or a bit lonely, because that's, a, that's, that is kind of the nature of the online world, as it were, in that you have an easy connection to virtually everyone, if you want to. But it's not the same as having that person there. Like I, I, I speak to my friends from you know from the days, and it's it's great to, to speak to them on a regular basis. But it's even better on the instances where I actually get to talk to them in person. I feel like there is a you have so much more of a different connection when you're in the same room as someone. You can really bounce off of someone, and that's in terms of personality. You can. There's more kind of there's a kind of spontaneous spontaneity and an energy about being in the same place, and this is the same thing as um because during the pandemic there was kind of this question mark over you know would cinemas exist anymore? Do we need cinemas? And I feel like as we've started to come out of the pandemic, 
there there is this kind of feeling like no cinemas are fine actually people will still want to go to cinemas they still want to go to places like that because they're, they're kind of social hubs you know you, people need social hubs to kind of gather together for their hobbies and kind of share in the enthusiasm of being with each other you know that's that's the kind of spaces that people need to kind of feel energized and enthusiastic about themselves and others and i as much as i am a terribly awkward person in real life i i like people i i genuinely like people when i when i connect with someone it's it's a great experience and so yeah it I, I, and plus, I feel like we need we need spaces for all all different kinds of people to allow people to express themselves in in whatever way they see fit. And having having that representation there is very important. It, it, it is you know if you if you don't have representation, then it it basically forces people underground, and it's not it's not you're not actually representing people. It's so. It's 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 all it's all about the, the about having spaces for people to connect with each other because you know hum, you know us us human beings we we are social creatures we need that social interaction and I think one of the hardest things about the pandemic is that we were forcibly severed from that yes we have all this wonderful technology I am speaking to you right now in a completely different time zone but you know it's it's still a separation from me actually being in the same room talking to you mm -hmm. in Australia. So, you know, the, 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 it, that's basically, that's basically the point, you know, it's it, like you need to, and I was kind of missing conventions, you know, conventions are sort of the same thing. And again, conventions are sort of on the way back now. We're obviously not quite out of the pandemic yet, but things are, at least looking a little bit more optimistic than they once were but again though those conventions are spaces for people to congregate to interact as it were and i think it's important to have those spaces that for people to actually share their passions and what excites them but also have places that make that are powerful though though there i don't think we realized in many cases how powerful those kind of places and institutions and conventions were until they were suddenly stripped from us and then suddenly we just kind of felt bereft i apologize if my stomach is getting on the microphone <laughs> oh, I, I didn't hear it but now we're, ev everyone's going to hear it in their in their heads right now you should you shouldn't have mentioned it your microphone isn't well isn't, just in case because sometimes I, ha I sometimes it has actually picked up on the microphone before <laughs> now i've had to junk takes like Oops. I'll see if I can fix it in in post. But yeah, I I completely agree <laughs> that the, the these physical spaces, these community gatherings are, are, are so important. So people, it's not only so you can go with your friends and discuss your passions, but you can stumble upon strangers that also have the same passions, and and you realize that exactly, you're not exactly. alone. And that that's the thing. You know, I feel like if if you, if you have those things uh you know you, you you don't have any social connection anymore and that's you, know, you need to have that honestly you know you can't just live your life going out doing the shopping come back home do the shopping come back home and there is that kind of interaction online other spaces but it's not as it's not the same thing and it's not to say that those are lesser in any sense but we need to there is, i feel like there is this sense of you know every, we can do everything online we can do that online we can do that online no 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 we need to have both you know you have online spaces and you have physical spaces you can have both and both are important well i'm i'm sorry that i wasn't able to fly over to england <laughs> to, to to talk to you in in person in in your classic colorful room with all with all the posters but yeah it's it's video digital everything has to be so cold and mechanical i have an i have another question next question is is on its way and it's a very appropriate question given the fact that you, that you talk about movies what is the best movie of all time objectively see i i 
See, I don't think I can I can give a true answer to that, but what I will say is my one of my favorite film uh, my favorite films probably um, Die Hard is definitely up there. Die Hard is the is a great example of is is it a Christmas movie? Genre. It is definitely a Christmas movie. Come on, <laughs> it's it's set at I'm Christmas. I'm skeptical. You know? I think people just say that because they want to be quirky, like oh, it's a Christmas movie. Lol, it's in I don't know. I, you know, I, I have seen, I have seen it for Christmas. I am diehard Christmas jumpers. You know, so. Okay, all right. <laughs> I mean, it's set on Christmas Eve. I mean, yeah, it's not traditional. But then again, there's a lot of Christmas movies that are not traditional. Gremlins is not traditional, but I still consider that a Christmas movie. Oh, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I okay. Mean, all right. I mean, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's, you know, it's a wonderful life. It's not that kind of Christmas movie, but you know, it's, it is a, it is a Christmas movie. I, I believe there was someone that I once read on Twitter that said something like, "It's not Christmas until Hans falls down the side of the building." <laughs> and, and of course, I have to ask, what is the worst movie of all time? Because you've, you've certainly experienced that. Oh man. Um... Hmm. See, there's a lot of movies that could fill in here by just being unabashedly boring, mm -hmm. just unbelievably dull. Boring um, is the, boring is the worst thing that art can be. Yes, <laughs> but I think the worst, the worst is pr well. See, the worst is a very difficult thing to to kind of pin down because I have seen movies of all sorts, like the kind of you know filmed it with a DV cap. Not, not even a DV cam, I filmed it with a VHS camcorder in the 80s and you can barely make out the audio. Yeah, those are probably technically the worst movies ever made, but we'll, we'll put those aside mm -hmm. for now. But I think uh, the, one of the worst ones I ever reviewed was definitely The Cavern. Like, The Cavern is just almost unwatchable at times in that the camera work... They 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 shot in really dark locations, and then they had to boost up the footage, and so it's hyper saturated. They keep getting the the bloody lights on top of their helmets right down the camera lens, so it just it turns into this horrible shaky dark mess where you'll be alternately where it's ultimately too dark, and you're being blinded by the lights, and you can't tell what's going on half the time. And then there's that unbelievably jaw-dropping twist and that ending that ending where you just go really you ended it there what, you ended what's it the twist what's the ending i see i can't see the the twist is that uh, actually what has been hunting them is a boy that was in a car uh, in a helicopter crash that ventured into the cave and has somehow managed to survive in the cave, but he turned into a into a primal caveman. And so the last two are women, and he abducts them, and then they wake up in his lair and they are nude, except they are in like furry furry bed covers or whatever. I don't know where he got those. I guess he must have he, he, I guess he must have skinned a mammoth or something while mm. he was in that cave. Fought a bear and won. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then it, I, I see. The problem is I can't talk about the ending because the ending I can, would make would demonetize this video. <laughs> the like the literal ending of this movie would demonetize the video, and I don't want to do that to you, man. That's why okay. I haven't reposted that video on YouTube. It's because the ending is basically makes it. I can't make any money off of that video on YouTube because of the content of the ending. <laughs> It's like, oh my god you ended it there what what even what even possessed you to end a movie like that like that what what were you doing sir <laughs> i'll just google image it later i'll be fine i'm sure it's fine yeah, it, it is genuinely one of the most like astonishing ways i've ever seen a movie end like you really ended it in that particular moment as like a shock thing i would assume like that is just obscenely bad taste no oh, and yet that director somehow managed to get actual movie gigs after that <laughs> you're making me want to see the kevin more than die hard no no don't no don't <laughs>
I actually, I was so astonished at that ending. I literally flipped on the director's commentary because there was a director's commentary, <laughs> as it turns out. And he goes, yeah, when, I, when we showed this at festivals, there were a lot of people that were kind of surprised at the ending. And I'm like, surprised is one hell of a fucking euphemism for that. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll definitely be checking that out. All right, so... That brings us to the last question that I always ask at the last part of One Story Building. And that is, of course, why are stories important? Ooh. Mm, indeed. I don't know whether you're going to regret asking that to someone that has a, a, a BA in English literature and film and theatre. <laughs> as long as you don't speak um, in, the, in the pretentious video essay voice. What, yes. what can movies tell um, us about life? Yes, well, truly, this is the most illuminating thought that anyone has ever spoken before since. Um, no, I think stories are important because they are reflections of ourselves in some ways. They, you know, they are our fears, our desires, that our fantasies, you know, our imaginations taking hold. And we get to kind of wrestle with our, our feelings and our emotions and things that trouble us and things that things that we aspire to. I think that stories have so many different purposes and that's why they're important is because they they allow us to to to, to kind of explore what what uh, things that maybe we can't do in our real life for various circumstances or to imagine a, a better world or try and shine a light on things that need to be changed i think that stories are powerful in in various different ways they can help people and they can change things in some ways and i think that because of that you know stories carry a responsibility you got to ask yourself why are you telling this story who are you telling it for and what what do i hope to accomplish with it and it doesn't have to be anything grandiose it doesn't have to be like yeah some some stories do help promote social change but you don't have to be ken loach you just have to if if you just sell for saying hey i want to make a story that's going to make someone's day better then yeah that's power too uh, that's the that's the flexibility of storytelling and the imagination of it and getting to do all these kind of cool things and sometimes they they click with people and they become the culture and it's kind of weird seeing you know bits of media over the years and they're so embraced that they become part of the furniture you you think you, you, you there are moments where you suddenly stop and think hang on there there was a time where that didn't actually exist how did the world exist before that and yet you know it's it feels like it's always been there so yeah store that's why we tell stories it's 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 to try and empower ourselves and to have fun and to to brighten up our days sounds good to me mr buck mm -hmm. thank you so much for coming on to one story building no problem uh, it's been an absolute pleasure